Ladies and gentlemen, thank you so much for joining me. I know wherever you are, you might be on a treadmill or in the car right now. Listen up, because for the next little while, we have got nothing short of a rock star, superstar, mind-blowing gentleman on the call. We're going to spend some time together, and we're going to talk about all kinds of things that are savage. We're going to talk about generating 19 million views on a single TikTok video. We're going to talk about coming from a project management background and building an incredible scaled company. We're going to talk about being a nerd who was taken and dropped off at a computer shop at his uh, in his early days to going forward and becoming one of the biggest names in gaming in the world, one of the biggest names in marketing in the world, one of the biggest names in AI and education in the world. It is with great pleasure and great excitement that I welcome Jeff Hunter to the call. Jeff, thank you, bro. Great to see you. Wow. That was a good intro. I had to save that one. <laughs> Dude, I, I, I have cut out like 90% of the accolades that I could have listed off there in that intro. Your your startup story is freaking incredible, man. So you you're you are self-confessed computer nerd. You got dropped oh, yeah. off at a computer store and were working for free, building computers. That led you to a kind of a project management and kind of getting into big organizations like Philips. You did some incredible stuff, but that's not where you took off. Like I'm just going to give the quick story and tell me, you know, uh, jump in. So you you did all this stuff. You were working hard. You ended up doing a, a college degree, but it took you 12 years to graduate because you were holding down two full-time jobs. You yeah. were doing great at this job. And then you realized that you needed help and you brought in a VA, right? Mm. And it was that realization that has now launched you as a incredible entrepreneur in this space um, and have created amazing companies. Like, tell me about that realization. You, you're there, you're working for Philips, you're a project manager, level three, woo! And <laughs> you're overworked, you're overwhelmed. You, you, you have no idea, you know, what the next day is going to bring, but you just hate the freaking paperwork and you brought someone in to help you out. How did that happen? You know, that was my first discovery of leverage and it just came out of like almost desperation. You know, like I hated one really hard aspect of being a project manager, especially at a Fortune 500 level, is that you do a lot of documentation. Mm. And I mean, a lot of documentation. Like at the time, um, I mean, I, right before I had left uh, Phillips, I had just completed, you know, an entire hospital redo. I, so what I did was I did all the IT infrastructure on healthcare systems that connected to patients in all of the hospitals in the Pacific Northwest. From so I was doing Seattle Seattle Children's Hospital, Oregon Health Sciences University, pretty much all the Providence hospitals, all the way up to Alaska, little remote islands. I was seventy miles away from the North Pole up in Nome, Alaska. So I was doing really a lot of work, and it's very taxing, you know, traveling and all this stuff. But then your job is not stopping stopping there. When you're done, you have to create what's called an as built, and you have to create project documents for people to follow and it was just overwhelming and wow. you find out that you're not actually managing projects anymore you're managing documents wow and thank so, god for the world for that because otherwise you'd still be crawling in wall cavities setting up cables and that's <laughs> just that would uh that would be working by the hour and these days you don't you don't work by the hour these days you run incredible companies and you do amazing things so thank god that that was a boring like part of the job because otherwise you wouldn't have reached out for that VA. How did you do it? Did you, did you Google something? Like what did you I, do? You know what? I, I, there was a website which still is active today called Fiverr. Mm -hmm. And this was like in the very beginning, I don't even know when Fiverr started, but you know, this is probably around 2013, 2014 when I started like becoming like aware that maybe I shouldn't be working so hard. Um, and actually I give Tim Ferriss credit because the four hour work week was one of my inspirations. Um, the e-myth, I mean, all of these one thing like these, you know, these, the, the all this kind of came out around the same time and it was just like one led to another and actually shout out to, uh, you know, a guy named Davin Michaels, uh, mm -hmm. who, Davin well. yeah. Yeah, Davin, who, you know, I him and and Chris Ducker, actually, I'd have to say Chris Ducker, he he created a website. It was called outsource to the Philippines.com. And it was probably just a lead gen site for his VA business at the time. But like he had some really good resources. Like, here's things you can download. And as a project manager, I didn't even know what a virtual assistant was. I was just looking for a resource. But I went to Fiverr and I just started typing project management. Or I think I was talking, uh, the one thing I hated was, by the way, Microsoft Projects. Oh, still to this day, hate it. <laughs> so, 
So I actually went into Fiverr and I typed in Microsoft projects and there's this guy from Pakistan. He had like a suit on and everything. And he said that he knew how to do project management, knew how to use Microsoft project and that he actually was a, a, a project PMI like project manager, like registered project manager. And I was like, that's crazy. Cause like I had been a senior IT project manager at Phillips and I still wasn't certified as a PMI. So I was like, okay, this guy hopefully knows something. And um, I, I just tried him out and it was like five bucks an hour, you know, and, and I know how long it takes to do project docs and, you know, you're busy doing things. You don't have like a two day, three days period to sit there and work on documentation. So I hired the guy. He gave me an estimate, said that he thought it would take, you know, I think it was like 18 to 20 hours or something like that. He came back in like two days. He must have worked nonstop and he came back. It cost me 40 bucks. <laughs> wow. And and he had the most beautiful project documents you've ever seen. They were color coded and stuff. And actually, I actually couldn't even turn it into my boss because I was like, there's no way he's gonna believe that I did this. Wow. <laughs> Damn. Like you, you, you um you cheated on the test. You got the answers that are too good. The teacher was looking at you going, bro, no way you did that. That's amazing. And so not to mention the speed. Like it was done in a couple of days. And like for me, amazing. it would take me like 30 days after a project because you know, you have to fit that time to do documentation in in between your real job. That's incredible. It's so good. So that was that a good experience, Jeff? Was that was that something that did you do? Did that go well for you in terms of the hiring and everything? It was that light bulb moment. Yeah, actually, mm -hmm. I became one of the, I got recognized as a top five project manager nationwide at the company. Because wow. um, you had somebody else I, in the app. Yeah, it was, it was my first moment of saying, wow, if I leverage other people to help me do things, especially ones like him that are better at doing, doing it than me, yeah. I'm going to look good. So, wow. you know, as a project no. manager... That is one of the things I was good at. I was good at putting the right people in the room to make projects successful and look good. So to me, it wasn't that far off. And it's interesting too, because, you know, I feel the same way the progression, I, I'm skipping ahead, but it's the same progression that I feel like going into AI. I've always learned how to pull in the right resources to get things done, to do better than me, whether it be human, now it's AI. And then my hybrid model now, which is now I'm teaching humans how to use AI to do things for me. So it's like, Oh, oh, I feel like man. I'm living in a dream. <laughs> so I'm I'm gonna get to that, but I think like what we what we just hit on there was no wonder you became an entrepreneur, right? No wonder you became a business owner because now your skill set is putting the right people in the room, right, and getting the project done by incredibly talented. Bit like talk about a business owner, that's amazing. So the reason I asked was it a good experience because obviously engaging engaging that first virtual assistant out of Pakistan helping you with your project management led you to now running a 150 staff member company, which is vastaffer.com. You're doing incredible things there. Like we had your, your EA pop onto the call just before, a whole bunch of instructions given. She's off running your company. You're here talking to me. Um, but VA Staffer is still one of your biggest uh, biggest enterprises. You mentioned Davin, who who obviously run uh, 123 Employee out of out of Philippines. Um, he, he was an inspiration for you. Did you did you kind of work with him? Like, how are yeah. you? It is now. Actually, like, there was an interesting moment where, you know, like we kept running into each other at events and, you know, I learned so much from him on, I didn't know anything about marketing when I first started my company. Um, so I was looking at, you know, who are the other companies that are really killing it? And I was modeling and learning from them and he was really doing some incredible things. And, you know, uh, I, I kept seeing him at events and, and, you know, so funny because we kind of befriended each other and, uh, Ironically, that's something that I'll have to say I'm very fortunate is that I've always believed in the spirit of collaboration. I have not been a huge competitor pretty much in my entire life. I mean, except for sports, I'm going to crush you. I was going to say, you get on the gaming we floor, play, you, this, hey, that's not true. We play Call of Duty, I'm crushing you. All right, sweet. Right? I love it. All right. <laughs> Matter of fact, right before this call, I was on a call with a coach that I hire. He's the number one League of Legends player for uh, Team Fight Tactics, and he was coaching me. So I have a yeah. two-hour session. Once once every couple of weeks, we'll have a two-hour session where he actually helps me play. That's how serious I am. Like even wow. when I play video games, I want to. That's be the that's, best. that's not that's not just letting off some steam after a heavy day. That's like getting into elite level, getting the coaching. So um, <laughs> so you let's let's come back. You, you've created vastaffer.com. So um. Can, can you just like give me the bullets of how that happened from your first VA to now I own a VA company? Yeah, well, what happened was uh, people started asking me, wow, 
how are you doing this? And I was like, well, I, I hired this guy and he's doing my documentation. And they're like, huh, interesting. Can you help me do that? Well, the problem is, is that I found out freelancers suck because mm -hmm. this guy, after a while, you know, I, I had built a relationship with him, but you know, he didn't really, he wasn't, he didn't work for me directly. So I couldn't tell yeah. him what to do. Right. Um, I tried to get him to work with other people and it didn't really work because they weren't the same as me as, you know, I'm pretty good at delegation and, mm -hmm. you know, I was doing remote teams before remote teams were cool back in 20, 2012, you know? Wow. So, um, you know, they just, they just didn't get the hang of it. So one time, actually one of my friends approached me and said, Hey, what if you hired the person and I could just, you already have them trained. Like you just let me use the one you've already trained up to do what I need. And then I'll just pay you. And I was like, I guess I could do that. And he goes, yeah, you could be the VA staffer. And I was like, I went to go, I went to GoDaddy, typed in vastaffer.com. It was available and I bought the domain. And that's pretty wow. much how the business started. Amazing. <laughs> Amazing. So was so when did that kick off? Like what year was VA Staffer founded? That was like the end. Uh that was probably the either the end of 2013 or the beginning of 2014. Amazing. Um, Amazing. So, I think so I bought the domain probably 2014, but the idea and everything had been in 2013. And how quickly did you grow? So you, just before we hit the record, you were saying you're at 150 staff right now. Um, I'm sure you've got thousands of, of, of projects out there, people that, you, that you're looking after. Um, how quickly did that scale? Like year one, year two, year three? When did you go from a project manager at Philips to, hey, I better do this full time? You know, what's crazy is that I had, I had thought about building an office in the Philippines. And it just, you know, the Philippines is very affordable. The people are really incredible. And, you know, the opportunity gap over there is so big. It's so sad. The, the lack of opportunities that Filipinos have, mm. um, especially in the wage, like it's unbelievable. Like most of the time when I hire somebody to work for me, I'm paying them like twice as much as they're getting in their last job. You know, yeah. like yeah. our starting salary is like twice what they're getting already. Yeah. Yeah. So like, you know, it's life changing stuff. Like I actually have to have in our training sessions, we prepare them on what not to do when you get this job, which is tell everybody that you're making all this money <laughs> because they all want it. Right. Like just things that Americans never have to deal with or Australians, you know, yeah. like us yeah. in Western countries never have to worry about that culturally. Yeah. Right. But what's really weird for me is that, you know, when I was over there, this is uh, tw this is uh, December, the, the January, I think this is January 2014. I was over there just exploring the idea of getting an office. And um, I just came up on this really amazing uh, penthouse. It was a 2300 square foot, you know, all marble floor, like it was really awesome, had a really great view of Makati City, which is like the Silicon Valley of the Philippines. And um, I had brought over one of those Google IP phones because it was so expensive back then to get an internet phone like online in 2014. Mm. And I had bought brought one of my phones from America over and I had set it up and it was already registered to my business. And I just, I the next day I got a phone call and this guy was like, hey, Jay. And I'm like, yeah, uh, a lot. Of, so I'm Jeff J Hunter. A lot of people call me Jay. My, you know, some of my close friends call me Jay. And I was like, okay, this must be a close friend. He's like, hey, Jay, um, you still got that outsourcing company? I'm like, as a matter of fact, I'm setting up an office right here. I got a new office in Makati. He goes, he goes, oh, well, it's been a while since we spoke. Let me tell you what I've got going on. I got the sales team. I'm just coming into a new company as the VP of sales. They want me to set up a sales enablement team and do data scraping and like build out some contact leads in LinkedIn. Is that something you think your team could do? I'm like, yeah. He's like, well, what would that look like? I'm like, well, how many... How many VAs do you need? He's like, oh, we'll probably start out small, maybe like 10. <laughs> and I was like, at the time I had like six VAs. Right. right? Okay. My entire company just got yeah. taken. Like I, at this time, I'm still two years into my full-time job and I'm just like doing this as a hobby. It's not even profitable yet. And he's like, I need 10 VAs. And after we had this conversation, he goes, hey, 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 Jay. I'm like, yeah, he goes, you still living over near whatever in Utah? And I was like, I've never lived in Utah. He goes, you're virtual assistant, whatever guy. And I was like, oh, so it's a different company that has a similar name. He was trying to, he was trying to find the guy. Wow. So he called me. Mistake. Yeah. And he said, Hey, you know what? I really enjoyed our conversation and I like what you had to say. And I'd like to give you an opportunity since we obviously spoke for 30 minutes and I don't want it to go to waste. 
He's like, why don't you send me a proposal? So I don't need, I don't even think I slept that night. I worked, I worked on a PowerPoint slide, sent it over to him. I even had, I even recorded a video of me and like embedded it in there so that he would get to know me. That is awesome. And next thing you know, he's getting me through legal. And I won at that time, the biggest contract of my life. And it was the first time in my mind where I said, I could actually do this on my own. Wow. Incredible. Amazing. So from there, like, so you've, you've gone on now to, to become known uh, in multiple different spaces. And the reason we got to talking is because somebody that, that I trust, respect, and, and has been a previous guest with us, um, I asked them, who do you follow for AI? And your name came up. Um, mm. But again, not jumping too, too quickly to that moment, because our entire audience, people, uh, you know, I want to see, how do, we, how do we start up? How do we scale? How do we get that to, to, uh, to an enterprise level like Jeff's done? Um, so how did you then go from that biggest contract? Cool, now we've got some runway. Now we're starting to get some traction. You're, you're looking at this as a, as a potential full-time. Um, how did you then become known as the savage marketer? How did that happen? Whew. I started just tackling bigger clients. and. Cool. I think one of the best ways to up level your game is to work with people that are just awesome people. Yeah. And I learned from some really incredible people. One of those people is Dan Henry, mm. who um, he's still kind of fledgling in the marketing space, but he's done, you know, multi, multi million. Sure. He's doing very well. Yeah. Uh, matter of fact, he was the first marketer that I would say started around the same time as me that he was the first marketer that I knew that was building and growing. And he was the first person to show a picture of actually having a million dollars in the bank, like not making a million, but having a million, which is a big difference. And I was like, man, he's doing something. And I wanted to work with him. And he was launching something called the Savage Marketing Academy. And the Savage Marketer, this brand right here on this hat, this is actually his brand that he built around a product called Savage Marketing Academy. And he hired me and my team to support. We had a VA for him. And basically he had an offer where it was like a monthly subscription for his uh, training program. But the problem was his offer. Oh, Dan, I've never said this out loud on a podcast. So Dan's probably going to be, I should, I should have him on the show talking about it with me, but he had an offer. This is a good lesson for marketers too. Your offer has to be good and you have to be careful for cheapskates, okay? Because here's what happened. He had a $1 seven-day trial and then after seven days, it rebuild you at $2.97 a month. Well, guess what happened at seven days? All the cheapskates tried to cancel because they were trying to download all his program for the seven days for free. And it doesn't matter if it was a Friday, Monday, Saturday, Sunday, they, if they didn't cancel in time, if that wasn't processed, it would bill and then he'd get chargebacks and, you know, problems and yeah. refund requests. And um, it was a nightmare. And basically he ended up saying, hey, you know what? I'm done with this. I'm closing it down. But I had already spoken at his event in 2018 called AdCon Live. And AdCon Live was really fun. It was really my first time speaking in front of a group of over 300 people. You know, I've done like 30, 50, maybe 100, but this was like 350, 400 people. And it was like my first kind of invigorating moment. Like, wow, you know, like that first, like I'm really valuable. I'm important. Like it's right. a really interesting feeling for someone who worked in the corporate world, who the personal brand was always a threat to the company, right? So um, after, at that event, he had all the Savage Marketer swag, hats, shirts, everything. And I was like, man, this is incredible. Some of these hats on this wall back here you can't see are actually the original hat that I that took from the event in 2018. And I was, I had, so this was long gone, okay? This is already the end of 2019 now. And my son, who at the time was, uh, I guess he was nine, we we're in, or maybe eight, we we're in my black convertible uh, Camaro. And I know you like cars. I am a car guy. Absolutely. I got a black convertible Camaro and I'm wearing a Savage Marketer shirt, which is a black shirt that says Savage Marketer in red and white. Oh, and just God. like this hat says Savage Marketer, basically that's exactly what was on the shirt. And my son, because I had extra swag, my son was also sporting a Savage Marketer shirt and hat. And I took a picture. We took a selfie in the car with the top down and I sent it to Dan because we're still friends. And I said, Dan, What'd you ever do with this brand? He's like, oh, I still have it. I was like, would you sell it? And he goes, what, what would you buy it for? <laughs> and I gave him my idea and he goes, well, how much would you buy it for? 
And I threw out a number and he was like, Jeff, come on. Well, I'll give you the number. I told him at first $3,000 and he goes, Jeff, come on, man. He goes, that's a premium brand. And by the way, I could sell all the swag left over in my garage for more than that. And I was like, swag? So we came up with a magic number. We worked out a deal. And then part of the deal was I had to fly to Tampa and take all that crap out of his garage. <laughs> So there's the story of the Savage so he Monster. Actually, he wasn't, he he wasn't selling you a business. He was engaging somebody to do trash removal. Like he just wanted somebody to come and get the stuff. Savage Marketer yeah. was trash removed. And I one man, it. hey, what's the yeah. saying? One man's trash is another man's treasure. For sure, brother, for sure. So now you've, you've turned that into a global empire. Like you you are well known in the spaces. And of course, you caught up with our, uh, our business partner, Chris, uh, over there at Board of Experts at Arnix uh, event, um, which is where I first met Dan Henry, by the way, at, at another one of Arnix events at WebinarCon. Um, but you've now turned that again, into a global brand where you are known in the top circles as being able to take a concept and create a campaign and bring that together. How how big is the marketing element of your empire? You know, when we put it against VA stuffer, like the taking those incredible brands, taking those amazing stories and building their campaigns for them. Is that something that just ignites your fashion, your passion? Yeah, it's funny because the reason I became a marketer is because I actually hired one and I've paid a lot of money that I didn't have in 2016 or 2017 when I first left um, my job. I, I, by the way, I'm only truly a full-time entrepreneur since 2016. Matter of fact, I left on leap day, February 29th of 2016 from my full-time, my let's just call it the best and last job I'll ever have. <laughs> wow. yeah. Right? Um, so when I left, I really hit the ground you know, with nothing. I had no contacts. I had really no knowledge of how to run a business. I had no knowledge of marketing. I had no knowledge of sales. All I knew was how to build really good teams. And I knew what people wanted. At least I knew that. So I started thinking, well, who would I, I the first thing that came to my head was like Russell Brunson and all that. Like I need to build a funnel. I need to build a, a pipeline. I ended up meeting somebody who came, became a coach of mine. And then she introduced me to uh, another guy who was like Russell Brunson's PR person or whatever. And I was like, really? And then he was going to do this big deal for me. And you know what? He ended up scamming me. He ended up scamming me and her for $10,000. And um, I never got anything out of it. I just a wasted trip to Idaho um, because it was like right after Inner Circle, Russell Brunson's mastermind, he was going to have like a day exclusive workshop with me to build the brand and you know, work on my, work on my personal brand, work on my campaign, my, my story, um, you know, start pitching me, start, you know, all these things and, and nothing materialized. And I, I actually tried to get my money back, but that was my first lesson of never using actual money. Always use a credit card when you do a high ticket offer. Mm. If you get scammed, you can always get it back on the credit card. If you send money through your bank on a debit card, you cannot. No. I found that the hard way. And I didn't have money at that time. So I was broke. Yeah. So I did it the old fashioned way and said, here's all the things he promised me that I would do. And I had to figure out how to do it myself. And I did. And because of that, I was like super ambitious. Like, I'm going to make this happen. I, I had no choice because at, at that time I was literally moved in with my grandparents. I was that broke. Wow. I had left a Fortune 500 job making 150K, let's say 132K plus comps or whatever, down to barely making enough money to pay payroll and moved in with my grandpa with a wife and a three year old kid. Talk yeah. about embarrassing. Yeah. Okay. So I had to, I just had to learn the hard way. And um, once I learned the ability of marketing and how to sell and how to really deliver results, Oh man, I got obsessed with it. Mm. And uh, I just, I didn't have resources. I didn't know anyone to do ads. I didn't have money for ads. So I just learned how to do organic traffic, how to build my network organically. Even today, I'm outside of the Black Friday deal that I ran this year that did, by the way, really well. I've never ran ads for my company in all almost 10 years now. Amazing. So yeah. Wait. So how did how did you do it if you never ran it? <laughs> I literally networked the heck out of everything. Wow. I went on Facebook. I went in Facebook groups. I found 
uh, all the communities of of influencers and and people like Dan Henry, people that had big mouths that I could connect with. And my goal was if I could work with somebody and show them value and they could actually help refer me, I'm actually going to go back all the way to 2017 and I'm going to give a huge shout out to Jay Abraham. Mm -hmm. I was at an event. You know, Jay Abraham? Yeah. I was at an event. It was a, it was a summit and it was a live event. And just by God's chance, the clicker stopped working. The battery went out while he was giving his presentation. And he said, well, the clicker went out. I can either wait here for a battery or you guys can start lining up and I'm going to start answering your questions. Before he finished that line, I was at the microphone. I was right there. I was like the second person in line. And I told him about VA staffer. I told him I'm struggling getting new clients. He said, where do you get most of your clients? I said, most, mostly referrals. He goes, okay, so tell me about your referral program. I felt like this small because I had no referral program. And he said, well, Jeff, let me tell you something. If you are getting most of your clients right now, your clients are referring you for free. Imagine how much they would refer you if you paid them. And that mentality changed everything for me. And now, um, matter of fact, I just got done sending another check to one of my clients for 350 bucks today for another referral. Amazing. So that's a, a great way. And of course, it's genuine. We have a 3% churn rate, which means our clients year over year, we only lose 3% of our clients. And in this industry, that's like 3000% more than average. Like, it, it, I don't know if you know anything about like team building and virtual, you know, outsourcing and virtual assistants, but the turnover rate is really high. My guess is it's probably 30, 40%. Mm -hmm. And my guess is the stick rate is probably three months or less. Yep. We have clients that we've, still had since 2014 today. <laughs> Amazing. Amazing. So do the the two, I want to dive into AI and, and I'm conscious of your time, but just one last question in this space. Do the two factors now um, play together really well? Like VA staff, where you're able to create and engage real, uh, genuine, talented people into an organization to then follow a playbook that Savage is setting up. Are you Are you building these together, literally saying, here's the playbook, affiliate referral program, networking, you know, all of the stuff that you've created um, an incredible result from, and then dropping that into VA staffer and saying, here's how to run this program for new client, insert client names here. And, and uh, is that how they're working together? Bingo. Go on. You got it. So VA staffer was the business I set up pretty much by 2018. VA staffer has already been running by itself. Right now I have 10 people on my leadership team, sales, recruitment, training, onboarding, I have people that do payroll, you know, HR. Admin. So like it runs itself. And by the way, they're all in the Philippines. The only the only other person um, on my team that's American is Sam. And technically he works for Savage Marketer. <laughs> um, Samuel is actually a student of mine from 2017 in my copywriting program. That's by the way, I learned how to do copywriting. And that was my first course ever was a copywriting course. Um, and when I when I learned copywriting, he was a student of mine and then he became a student of my AI program. And then he approached me and said, Hey, are you going to do a black Friday this year? And I was like, uh, I wasn't thinking about it. I got too much consulting going on. He goes, what if I did your entire black Friday deal for you? And we just did a percentage deal where I get paid on results. I was like, yeah, sure, man. Well, <laughs> it sure. worked so well. I ended up hiring him on. So anyway, right, um, so what, what ended up happening was, you know, in 2018, when I set up my business to basically run itself, then I was able to focus more on the marketing. You see, mm -hmm. and this is where a lot of founders, oh, if there's one thing people get out of this here, because I, you know, hopefully they're listening to this going, oh, this is a valuable lesson. Like this is the lesson that I learned. Us as a founder, us as a business owner, transitioning from business operator to business owner, as soon as you move out of operations and move into ownership, then your job is to grow the business. Like your job is to build the brand, Make sure you have the right people in place to run the damn thing and then market the hell out of it. That's Love what I've learned. Get the hell out of the way and market it. Beautiful. Right. Beautiful. And, and the problem is a lot of people, they try to market things before they're ready to run. So what happens is that there's an entrepreneurial trap where they're marketing things, but when they sell things, it actually creates more work for them. So they can't do more marketing because they can't sell anymore because they're the ones fulfilling. Right. So that's the key. And I, I said this jokingly before our, our call here today, but I'm just very fortunate. The very first company that I started was a staffing agency. 
Because every time I have a crazy idea, I already have the people to help me build it. That's amazing. <laughs> or I can have them hire people with the skills to do so because that's what I do. It's a staffing agency. Beautiful. Yeah, amazing. So in terms of business growth, would you say that that's the, the principal thing that a business owner needs to do is to be able to um, get out of their way, put talented people into that position, get out of ops and start actually stepping up? Yeah. And I think, you know, I'll be straight with you. It wasn't an easy transition for me. I was very, I'm a, I'm a kind of a control freak. I'm not so much now. I'm not so much now. Um, but when I come from a project management background, you know, I want to make sure things are running smooth. Everything has to be perfect. And, you know, what I found is that I would tell myself a couple of lies. One, that no one could care about my business as much as me. Mm. I can guarantee you I have people on my team that care about my business more than me. Okay. That's right. You know, like I'm at a point in my life now, and I think this is the, this is what's really interesting as a marketer. And probably if people are listening to this that are good marketers, they probably relate to this. But once you know how to make money, like you're not really too worried about things in life. Like I could make an, an incredible offer and make money. I could close up my shops tomorrow. So our new business with a brand new offer, I can make money. I'm not worried about money. So but the only way you can get that, <laughs> right, is by learning really good marketing skills. So mm -hmm. like what you said, like if you are a great marketer, you can build a really good product, like build a really good product and the marketing will do itself if you have a good product, right? And once the product's going and it's running and you, you've got a really great fulfillment process, all you do is just feeding the engine. You're just adding more fuel to the fire and letting that thing run. And it's one of the most fulfilling, one of the most fulfilling feelings as a business owner is just watching what you've made like a grand architect just work. I love it, man. I love it. So in the last 12 months, we've seen this incredible new avenue come into our world, which is AI. And we're watching you, uh, if, if anybody that's watching this on, a, on video or Roku or wherever you're watching, uh, you, you might see our AI persona method shirt right, <laughs> there, right there on Jeff. Um, I speak AI. So, dude, you, you have quickly become uh, an influencer in this space, right? You have quickly become a person that gets name dropped. When people talk about learning AI, when people talk about engaging AI, your name gets dropped. How did you pick up AI? How did that happen? How did you go, whoa? And then what did you do with that with that realization into VA staffer and into now AI persona method? Funny story. <laughs> I've always loved AI since I was a little kid. And, you know, growing up, I remember, I don't remember if it was Wednesdays or Tuesdays, but I used to run home. And we would watch me and my mom. My mom's a huge Trekkie, Star Trek. Nice. And we used to watch Star Trek: The Next Generation religiously. Mm -hmm. All right. And it went into it went into Star Trek: Voyager, and then I things started going off with Deep Space Nine. It was kind of getting nutty out there. But for me, Star Trek: The Next Generation, there was a character on there. His name was Data, and he was the coolest. He was an android. He looked like a human, but he was actually a robot. But he had all of the universe's knowledge put into him. But he struggled with his own individuality, his personality, and his emotions because he's a robot. So the only way he can express himself is basically by imitating actual humans, right? Which, by the way, sounds a lot like the AI models we're using right now, like ChatGPT and Claude and others, right? So um, I've always been obsessed with AI uh, from the conceptual of AI. And I've always been a huge IT nerd. Like you said, I got dropped off at a computer store when I was in high school and actually even before high school and basically worked on computers for free to learn. I loved it. I was a huge gaming nerd and took, you know, I went to school for computer science and ended up going into a business computer information systems degree. And like, I've always been fascinated by it. But see, this is what's really interesting. The reason why I became an expert in the field is out of desperation again. Isn't that weird? There's a recurring theme here, Walt. Yeah, absolutely. Like, I'm, no I'm noting it. I literally just looked at my timestamp because I I'm noting it. Here it is again in November of 2022, okay, when ChatGPT came out to the public beta. And when I logged into that and started using it, everyone was thinking how cool it was, which, by the way, I did too for the first couple prompts. And then the only thing that was going through my head was, 
my team in the Philippines is doomed. That's the only wow. thing I could think right. of. Mm -hmm. I was like, why would people hire a human when the VA, uh, an AI VA can do this? Yeah. So this is what kind of like blew my mind. I was like, oh my God. So I went mission critical having 150 people on my team. Mm. And I said, hey guys, I'm creating an AI division of VA staffer right now. We're going to figure out how we can leverage AI to make our business better and how to serve our clients more. So we started thinking about all the things that the VAs don't do right now, because see, Filipino VAs, even though they speak great English, it's still not American English. It's not Western English, right? Like even as you and me as Westerners in Australia, we have a different, and I would even say it's more of a marketing-esque English, right? right? Yeah. Like even the words we use, like in the Philippines, um, when people go to take a picture, they say compress. When does anyone in a Western Amer English uh, is ever uh, tell people to compress to take a picture they say compress compress <laughs> it's so funny the first time i heard that by the way um so we started thinking okay well now with ai because it has perfect english the language barrier is gone by the way that was my article i wrote last month in entrepreneur.com i have a column there it's called the language barrier is no more and that's what it's called it's it talks about how chat gpt and other ai language models are basically creating a global economy and I'm hopefully leading that charge. Um, so what's going on here is we're like, okay, we can use the, now the VAs that we have in the Philippines can now do social media content. They can now do newsletters. They can do now, they can now do sales copy. That just opens up to so many different things that they weren't able to do before because they didn't have great English. So that's what we started doing. And I put a whole train together. And ironically, I started training my team how to do this. And guess what? I started making social media posts about how I'm training my team how to do that. And my people here in America were like, dude, I want to learn. And that was when the AI persona method was born. I said, because by the way, the reason why it's called the AI persona method is because I figured out this really interesting way to get the most results out of AI. And right now it's still the best proven way possible. I have over 300 students in my community. I have almost a hundred people in my certified program. And what we're doing is we're actually training the AI to be like a virtual employee, like an AI employee. We call it an AI persona. So you can basically create a marketing copywriter for your team, a newsletter writer, a social media person. You can do a data research person, SEO, right? And these are all basically like AI employees that work for free in your company that do all these things. And it has been an absolute game changer um, and now that my, and now I don't have to worry, like, for example, my own assistant, Jackie, who you met, she's never written a newsletter in her life. Mm -hmm. She's written over 70 newsletters to my clients yeah. this year using an AI persona that I've already trained to talk just like me. Wow. Amazing. Amazing. Wow. So that was a lot. <laughs> we'll, we'll put, we'll put all the, the links in the show notes here, guys, but it's AI persona method.com. Um, so Jeff, I'm, I'm fascinated now and, and I, I wanted to dive into gaming. I wanted to dive into your TikTok. <laughs> like your TikTok game is on point, bro. Like <laughs> you, you've got 143 as of this moment, you've got 143,000 subscribers, which must blow your mind. But you've had 19 million views on your videos. I wanted to get into that. But before I do, and I'm very conscious of time here, guys. So thank you for sticking with us. We, um, we can go over We can go over a little bit. Go yeah, I, I'm hoping everybody, like, guys, if you're on the treadmill, just do another couple of miles because this we're still here, right? If you're, if you're <laughs> driving, call your boss, that's, tell him to be late because let's, let's that, do another couple of That's let's why I'm on my sit-stand desk, you know? Nice. I like, me too, me too. Hey, so so um, we've got we've got the AI persona method. And that, that comment that you just made, I can retrain a team of people to act as me in my business is amazing. And I'm sure there's anybody listening is just gonna be uh, super curious about that. Again, hit up Jeff because he is a leader in the space. Dude, as somebody that's come from computer sciences background, geeking out in, in a computer shop, seeing AI at an early, early age, seeing the impact that it's having, creating a hybrid business model, which I think is just going to be uh, massive, like it's a wave that businesses are just going to be adopting um, and, and absolutely need to be. Massive scalability, yeah. What do you think is next? Like, I know you're a, you're a huge uh, decentralized finance guy. You're a huge, um, you know, proponent of tech and, and, and that kind of stuff. What's next? What's well, can I be honest with you and tell you what I'm... No, lie to me, dude. I'd rather lie. Lay it out. I'm, 
obviously I've said all sorts of crazy opportunities and different ways I've monetized it. I mean, I've done $400,000 in AI consulting this year. I'm working with some of the biggest brands like Agora Financial, you know, like mm. um, I'm working with, I'm speaking at, you know, events that I never even imagined attending, let alone speaking at, you know, invite only stuff. I'm getting paid. So <laughs> I'm getting paid a lot of money. And I have to admit, like, sometimes I'm, I'm pinching myself, but you know, all of that aside, you know, it's been a fun, fantastic run and a great opportunity, but I'm actually really worried. Um, what I'm really worried about right now is I know that people are going to be using AI to do a lot of the content they're doing. And unfortunately, the people who are in control of the AI are the same people who are in control of the internet, who are the same people who can control the government. And now we're looking at a conspiracy theory type thing, which unfortunately, I wish I could say, um, the only difference we've noticed about the, the difference between the truth and a conspiracy theory the last few years is about six months. Mm. So I'm hoping that it's not six months. But what I will tell you is that we have to be very concerned about who is in control of the data. OK, there's ethical concerns about who like like, for example, they they used to show where all the data was fed to get into ChatGPT and Claude and these other platforms. But guess what? Now they're not showing it. Why? Because they're straight up taking books and books and books that are written by people like us and they're dumping it in there and they're training their AI models on everyone else's work. Okay. Same with mid journey, same with ideogram and Dolly. They're all taking all these amazing artists work and they're basically using the AI to understand it and imitate it. So what is happening right now? One, uh, let me give you the, the good side and the bad side. Number one, the good side is that right now, because there's going to be so many people creating content, right now, it's never been more... Oh, I have the quote for you. Okay. There's a whole quote for you. In an age of automation and AI, it's never been more, more important ever to be human. The human touch is missing. Every time I go on social media, I see someone else's social media post with hashtags who's never posted before. And I know they don't even know what a hashtag is, but they're in ChatGPT creating content and it's crap, okay? So the, the opportunity is that now is a really amazing time to build your own brand and stand out against the people that are literally just putting out the minimum effort. Um, by the way, a lot of my content's written by AI. You wouldn't know because, well, that's the point. If you're good with AI, you're not gonna know that it's AI, okay? So building a brand. Um, my advice, by the way, you better start building a community now because you're gonna be fighting with everyone over content. Content mm -hmm. isn't going to be content already since AI has come out is created so much faster. It's, it's nuts. So produce really good content and build a community, bring people in. It's going to be more important than ever. Number two, the downside, <laughs> not only the control of the, not only the control of the data, but the control of the output, the people that are writing this stuff, they have a very specific viewpoint. They have very specific viewpoint around the world. And if you if you don't believe it, you can ask it some some very interesting questions about individualism. Ask it ask it about the importance of individualism. Eventually, it's going to come back to the power of collectivism. Okay, um, individual rights, freedoms, liberties—they're all under attack. And uh, well, I'm going to sound like that guy, but we uh, really need to stick together and make sure that we have protections against what is being fed to people through AI, our children are susceptible. Our children are susceptible. The world is susceptible. You know, we're, if you're a marketer, you're a business owner, whatever, you know, you're like the top 0.1% in the world of having a mindset. You have to remember a lot of people in the world, they don't have the right tools and education. They're not taught to critical think. Even in the universities now, they don't teach kids to be critical thinkers anymore. They're indoctrination centers. So now it's gonna be reinforced and backed up by asking AI a question. And instead of Google giving the results that it wants you to see, now the AI is gonna give you the results that it wants you to see. And we're gonna see a very interesting divide here between the people who actually know the truth and the people that call it misinformation. Amazing. So there's gonna be people that are listening that are going, what can I do? I, I'm, just, I'm just me. I'm just a tiny little drop in this ocean. I'm a business owner trying to survive in this world. I just want to make money, feed my kids and have, you know, that, 
I don't care who's like this. This is gonna. This is the mentality, right? The mentality is that's a bigger question than me. So long as nobody rocks my boat, you know, <laughs> everything's gonna be all right. So what what can somebody do? What should someone do? What is what should a business owner, an entrepreneur, and, well, and not about like you know other than critical thinking, other than judge every piece of information that you get and and really make your own decisions and dive into it, all of that kind of stuff aside. What should a business owner do now? Let me tell you, there is a large large AI disparity gap right now. And when I say AI disparity gap, I'm talking about the gap between the businesses that are already leveraging AI and the businesses that are not using AI. On average, the businesses that I consult with are getting anywhere from 20 to a 40% productivity increase using AI. Let's use the conservative aspect of that, Walt. Let's just say it's 20%. If you're getting a 20% increase in productivity and output in your business using AI in a five day work week, that means five, an extra 20% is an extra day. That means you're getting six days in a one week period, one week, six days. That means in one month, which is by the way, 4.34 weeks, I'm a, I'm a numbers guy. That means that in one month, you basically got a free week's worth of productivity. And the crazy part is it's compounding, which means in three months, now you have three months worth of weeks, which is now an entire month of free work. You've worked three months and you've done four months of work in it. And I did the math. It comes out to be in about a, a one year time period, you get a 900% increase in productivity and decrease in costs. And um, by the way, I just want to make another fair warning. For business owners, you're you're looking good because you'll be able to maximize your productivity. Um, the people that are that should be scared, uh, social media managers, uh, copywriters, marketers, anybody that AI is able to now basically imitate the best copywriters in the world, you got to watch out and you better figure out a way to integrate it into your business right away because you mm -hmm. do not want to be that company that's left behind on the other side of the disparity gap. Because you're not going to feel the, the companies that aren't using AI right now, they're not really feeling it yet, you know, um, but wait until they see what happens next year. Wait right. until they see all the companies blowing them out of the water because they adapted and they're going to steamroll everyone. So for somebody who's listening that says, Jeff, I, I, I don't know, man, I, it's, it's brand new to me. I, I don't even know where to start. What should they do? What's, what should someone who owns a business and let's go. Let's 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 go broad, man. Let's go brick and mortar. Let's go, you know, local business. Um, somebody's listening to this, going, I, I okay, you got me. I, I want to learn. What do we do? What what should they do? What should be their first venture into this? Let's let's take it from the marketing angle. Let's take it yeah. from the marketing angle. What are things that you're doing in your business right now that are repetitive that you're either paying someone to do, or you don't have the money to pay someone to do? <laughs> let's stick right. with just those two. Ninety percent of the case. Every single business I know that's a brick and mortar either pays too much for a social media person who doesn't get results, right? Or um, they're not doing it at all. Yeah, is awake at two o'clock on a Sunday morning trying to do turn time and schedule their posts. Yeah, exactly. Or they're trying to do it all themselves. Yeah. So I would look at what are some different things that you can use AI to do? Uh, you know what? Here's another question. How many times do you email your customers? The answer usually never enough. <laughs> right. <laughs> right. Emailing your customers, like use AI right now to really drive revenue, bring in new customers, bring back your old customers, you know, so bring in new customers through social media, marketing, things like that, um, organically even, right? You don't even have to pay for ads, although it'll, it'll definitely write ads for you. Um, hit up your existing customers for deals and things and customer base, you know, by hitting up, hitting them up with emails. Um, you can have it write personalized cards. You can actually feed data. This is crazy. This is crazy that we can do this right now, but I've fed it a spreadsheet of my existing leads, deals that I'm working on that I haven't closed yet. I, I gave AI a spreadsheet of like the person's name and in my CRM, I have kind of like my notes on like the last engagement point that we had. And I asked it to write a short 150 word email, right? That would be a personalized email to wish them a Merry Christmas and then update them in somewhere in the chain. And then I basically have my assistant copy and paste it all and send it out to everybody. Amazing. Like little things like that. Who has time for that? Like who's going to email their 150 
you know, qualified leads uh, during Christmas and wishing them a happy, a Merry Christmas. With no a personalized one. message. Yeah. Right. So Only the guy I, would, I would use it on low hanging fruit. And once you start getting used to it, you start seeing the effects and seeing the value of it. You're going to jump in. And that's the, that's by the way, the takeaway is to jump in. I don't care how you use it, hmm. but figure out a way to jump in and just write down a list. What are things that I'm doing? What are things I'm not doing that AI could help with? And especially in marketing. I think the most like for an entrepreneur and you, you said like I want to go back to the story where you said the, the the marketing agency screwed you out of your 10 grand, gave you a list of stuff that they were going to do. And in desperation, you said, well, screw it. It still needs to be done. And you just learned. I think from an entrepreneur's perspective, like Jeff's message just there was jump in if you're. If you're not, like if you're listening to this podcast, chances are that you're already kind of in this space, you're listening to this stuff. Um, but if you're not, if for some reason you're thinking that it's out there and it's not it's not affecting you yet, um, do do learn. Do just 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 learn. That's it. Like you've got two two amazing uh, big boys, as you said, Jeff. Uh, I've got uh, two two daughters here. Um, and what I'm fascinated by in in our era, something that we you know are are experiencing, is that um, the kids have an opportunity to learn whatever they want, whatever they want. They can literally, and that's good and bad, but they can go into an environment and they can go, you know what? I really want to learn about this. And they can have some of the best experts in the world teaching them in a personal way, like Bingo. right in any, any space. I went to I went to tell my daughter off the other night. She was still awake at 11.30 at night. I was like, honey, come on, you got to get to bed. And she was on her iPad. And um, I said, come on, you're just, you're playing. And she turned the iPad around. And she was uh, she was studying um, Spanish, I think it was, with a wow. with, with a language teacher on YouTube. And she like she had two lessons left to go to complete the thing. And I was like, "Gosh, you should stay awake." <laughs> you know what? Get go ahead. Get, get back to it. Educate yourself. <laughs> I'm happy. It's great. Um, so, and and that's I guess that's the message I want to leave everybody with is like learn, do learn, get into YouTube, type the words, get into Jeff's. Instagram and just hit that little follow button because what you're posting out there is incredible. Um, and I, I would love to, to wrap this up, man. And, and again, I'm, I'm super grateful who I'm wrapping my arms around you and everybody out there at um, the Stuff.com and, and mate, what you're doing is incredible and putting out into the world is, is helping business owners. And I really appreciate that. Um, what's next for you? You mentioned a couple of books that have, that have driven you. You mentioned E-Myth, you mentioned the four hour work with, um, what are you reading right now? What are you kind of engaging in? And where are you going in the next, in 2024? What's your next 12 months looking like for you? Yeah, you know, the crazy part is I haven't really had, uh, I have not been consuming. Uh, I haven't been consuming anyone else's books. I've been writing them now lately. Nice. Um, I feel Billy like- things... Hire the author. Stop reading. Hire the author. Like, why not? Well, what, not That's why I'm going on this time. I, I can't I, I just, love just get you here. <laughs> I, I love learning and, I, and, you know, personal development is really important to me. But I also feel like right now there's an interesting opportunity for me to actually build things. And like the things I'm doing right now with the data sets and AI and you know the the, SAR, the size and of the clients I'm working with and and the different applications, it's so incredible. And uh, actually I'm working on releasing uh, a book called the AI. Uh, it's it's basically the AI consulting blueprint. You know, and I, I will tell you, well, I believe right now the biggest way, the easiest way to cash in on this AI revolution is by teaching these businesses how to adopt AI, just helping businesses use AI so they don't get ran over by those businesses that are already using it. You know, I agree. I think it's such and, a um, thing like. I, I've met people who are making millions of dollars teaching businesses how to reduce their costs by using AI and doing that kind of stuff. It's a massive, massive deal. And again, guys, if you're listening to this and you're a side hustler, you're somebody that's that's looking for an opportunity, you want to make something happen, self-teach, self-learn, find out what's going on and teach others because this is a revolutionary time in history. And the people with the knowledge are going to be able to 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 control their own futures and income. So super cool. Dude, thank you so much. Jeff, who who do you follow? Like who are the people that you're learning from in this space? Ooh, oh man. Well, right now, you know, uh, I, I have to take it back to the, the OGs, you know, like I'm a huge Dan Kennedy direct response marketer. I think, you know, the reason why I've been so successful in AI is because I studied so much copywriting and, um, actually let me disembark you instead of giving you a, who I follow, let me tell you what not to do. Do that. Okay? This is really valuable guys. 
And if you take one thing away from here, I hope you get it. I hope you get this. The reason why you are not getting results with AI is because you're using the databases that are built into ChatGPT and Claude and the other models. And um, now Facebook Meta is even letting like you start typing on Facebook and it it brings up AI. It's like, hey, let let AI finish writing it. And if you ever click on it and you're like, oh my god, it's really bad. It's really bad copy. Why? Because Facebook's taking everyone's Facebook post and everybody and, and Chad GPT is taking everybody's bad books and bad marketing copy and bad everything. And, you know, maybe there's 0.1% of good content that it actually absorbs and learns from. And when you ask it to write something for you, it's going to write modeling the 99% of all the bad stuff that's out there. There's actually some there's actually some studies coming out that ChatGPT is actually getting worse. It's degrading because it's learning from everybody's bad copy. All right. So what you want to do, whether whatever language model you're using, instead of asking it to write something in a specific style and trying to use prompts to tell it how to write, give it the data. Give it the data. It goes back to my boy at Star Trek data. You give it the data and you ask it to model and imitate that writing style. See, for me, I had a huge advantage because as a student of copywriting, I was obsessed with it. And I recorded all my top copywriters and social media experts that I saw, and I would learn from them. I, every time they made a viral post, I'd copy it and paste it somewhere. And then I would imitate it and learn how to do it. And then I built my own database of thousands of social media posts that I've created over 20, since 2017 to 2013. And what I do is I start out, this is a big tip right here. I start, if I wanted to write a social media post for me, I actually feed it a hundred of my top social media posts. And I say, analyze and learn my social media posts and then imitate my writing style, write a post about whatever. Wow. If you guys did, if you guys knew how good of a result you would get if you fed it data, you would never look at AI the same. Wow. In, in, in car terms, it's like, don't rock up to the dirty fuel pump. Make sure you've got a filtered premium juice before you before you're diving in. It's a great tip, man. Yeah. Hey, guys, um, we're going to wrap. We are live with uh, Jeff J. Hunter. Let's call him Jay because that's what friends do. Jay. Um, Dude, you are amazing to see, to see, as you said, from your story coming from, you know, a, a mom and dad who ran a, a pet car wash, um, sleeping four of in your bedroom to a point where you are an international uh, legend. You've been on over a hundred podcasts. You are a leader in the AI space. You've created an opportunity for business owners to get out of their own way with vastaffer.com. I want to say thank you from entrepreneurs to you. Uh, keep doing what you're doing. And uh, boys and girls, ladies and gentlemen, listen up to Jeff J. Hunter. Uh, if you're into uh, Tour of Duty or any of that gaming stuff, dude, you got to hit that button on TikTok because the man has got serious <laughs> aim. But if you just want to be a better human, you want to be a better marketer, and you want to grow your business, I suggest there's a whole bunch of channels there that Jeff's going to be able to help you with. So, man, thank you so much for coming on and spending the time. I appreciate the fact that you pushed back a meeting to stay with us. Um, love your work. Love your message. And uh, yeah, man, just really appreciate you. Thank you so much. Thank you all. Appreciate your time. And uh, I hope all of you guys jump in. Let's go. Thanks, man.